Welcome to uh, the workshop for the end of this month's community theme, which is special educational needs and disabilities. Um, I've asked Hazel Barnett, who many of you will know from within the community, to, to give a presentation and uh, to give a, a workshop on, on dyslexia, of which uh, Hazel has uh, many, many years of, of expertise, both as, as a tutor and as a, a SENCO in, in schools. So um, Hazel, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Um, Without further ado, I, I shall let you get on with your presentation uh, and, and we can go from there. It's going to be um, a really good overview of dyslexia and honing in on, um, you know, in the key areas, honing in on, on the details and what we can take away as, as a tutor. So over to you, Hazel. Thank you, Ludo. Okay, so this um, workshop has been entitled, What is Dyslexia? And any of you who work in the areas of dyslexia will know it's a really complicated um, subject and uh, you can't do justice to it in 40 minutes. Um, so I just want to add in a disclaimer that if anything I get is wrong or outdated, then please forgive me. But this is just from my own studies and my own experience. So, uh, OK. OK, so I tried to um, uh, target this at uh, tutors. Um, I've worked in the school of Senko and uh, I had to um, give strategies for um, teaching dyslexic children or children with dyslexia in the classroom. Um, each student had, uh, who was on the special education needs list had a pupil profile with their strengths, difficulties and uh, classroom strategies. So, um, and this was always linked to a formal assessment with standardized scores. Um, so that's my experience, but I, I um, try to imagine what a tutor might need to know about dyslexia. Um, why do I need to know about dyslexia? Because sooner or later you will, have, you will be teaching students who have dyslexia. So you need to recognise how dyslexia creates barriers for learning. Your usual teaching methods may not be appropriate ones for dyslexic students. You need to develop teaching strategies to overcome these barriers. So this is a quote from Dr. Harry Casty. If we don't learn, if they don't learn the way we teach them, can we teach them the way they learn? So I'm going to ask um, Ludo to read this to me to demonstrate a particular point about what it's like if you do have dyslexia. Okay, so here we go. Um, schools should not assume that children that, that children's difficulties always result uh, solely or even mainly from problems within the child a school's practice makes a difference for good or evil <laughs> thank you well done so as you can see i've taken a, a paragraph um or a sentence and i've taken out all the gaps and i've taken out all the punctuation and you could hear that that was quite difficult for Ludo to do. Um, and uh, some, for some students with dyslexia, um, decoding and reading um, is so laboured for them, so difficult, that it would just be a regular uh, paragraph for us would be like this for them. Um, and that's why it's so tiring for students with dyslexia, uh, all the reading and writing they have to do within school. Um, so, uh, and also the content of this um, can be lost. It, the, the, if you're just decoding all the time and, and spelling words out in, or, or sounding words out in phonics, then you lose the meaning. Um, and, it, and reading is not just decoding words accurately. You have to have the meaning coming alongside the comprehension. So um, the whole uh, area of dyslexia um, is on a spectrum. Some people say it's completely in the, within the child, like the educational psychologist, no, they, they would see that it's in the environment as well, but there would be more in the measuring with numbers end of the spectrum. And then you've got the critical theorists who um, think that the whole of the difficulty is within the, um, in the environment. And there's a huge movement towards dyslexia friendly schools, which is fantastic. Um, but of course, we know that the barriers are both uh, within the individual, um, but those, those difficulties can be minimized by being in a, in a very good uh, dyslexia friendly environment. Now, I wanted to give a simple overview, but it's not that easy um, because uh, dyslexia is a complex area because there are many different definitions um, and each definition has many different components. But 
Um, I would think I'm safe to say that dyslexia is always a difficulty with reading, writing and or spelling. It might be one, two or three of those. Um, so um, there are many co-occurring difficulties that come alongside, um, but I did hear once of someone being diagnosed and they didn't have the literacy difficulties, but there was obviously something complex going on, but generally um, it is a literacy difficulty. So dyslexia, and this is a good, um, this is a good comprehensive definition, and it is an up-to-date one. So um, dyslexia can be described as a continuum of difficulties in learning to read, write, and/or spell, which dis persists despite the provision of appropriate learning opportunities. These difficulties often do not reflect an individual's cognitive abilities and may not be typical of performance in other areas. Is there anything you want to ask me, Ludo, on that one? No, I think it's it's, it's really important to, to set that out kind of very early on, is, is that dyslexia is not the, you know, multitude of other factors and aspects that, that many people, you know, incorrectly think it is. It's, it's a difficulty of reading, writing and spelling, and I, I think it's really important for, for tutors to know that. But at this point, I think that that's great. No, no questions here. So, um... That's why the assessment is important, um, because you can see the profile of the strengths and weaknesses in each individual student. Um, and it might, it might come under the umbrella of dyslexia, but it will vary um, vastly from student to student. Mm -hmm. And the, the learning opportunities um, is important because um, these difficulties uh, manifest themselves despite, despite um, appropriate intervention. Um, so they may have been taught really well in the early years of reading, writing and spelling, but still they're really, really struggling and they, their scores are not um, as expected for their age. So the impact of dyslexia as a barrier to learning varies in degree according to the learning and teaching environment, as there are often uh, associated difficulties such as auditory and or visual processing of language based information. Phonological awareness. This is the um, awareness of uh, sounds within words. And when you're assessing um, students, you um, you might give them tests of alliteration. You might give them tests of what they call phoneme deletion, which is you you uh, give them a word and they have to take, take part of it away and 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 then tell you what's left. Um, now, spoonerisms is something that. Um, we used to use this for access arrangements testing, but now we, we have some more thorough testing, but um, we, were, we gave the children um, names of rock stars and they had to uh, spoonerize them, like um, David Bowie, David Bowie. And then this- uh, Nick, um, Nick Maga, yeah. So uh, um, I, did, I did fall on my face at one point because I was testing a child for access arrangements and this was an approved test at the time. Um, and uh, she said, um, Oh yeah, she said, we do these all the time at the tea table. You know, so a lot of these um, processing tests are supposed to be something something intrinsic. But of course, if you do it every day at your tea table, you might have poor phonological awareness, but still be good at uh, spoonerisms because you can do lots of practice. So this whole area of, of uh, assessment, prior knowledge and everything is all quite complicated. Um, oral language skills and reading fluency, um, short term and working memory, sequencing and directionality, number skills, and organisational ability. Hazel, so, um, yes. what's, could you just explain a little bit more about what directionality is? Um, that means uh, you don't know the difference between your left and right. Okay, great. I think that's what that means, that um, you, know, you, you get lost easily. You can't follow in instructions when someone says, turn to the left, turn to the right. Um, I think that's what the directionality is referring to. And sequencing, um, using a dictionary can be very, very difficult for a lot of students who have dyslexia. Um, working memory is holding on to something long enough in your mind to do something with it. So that's tested by um, giving the students um, a number, um, some digits, and then asking them to repeat them backwards. That tests working memory. And then um, you, you add, you, you keep increasing, you might start with three numbers, four, five, six, and then when the student has failed on three examples in a row, um, you just continue the test, then you add it up and then you make it into a standardized score. 
So that's how that works. Uh, number skills, um, we've heard from Judy about dyscalculia, which is a separate area in itself. Um, but um, students with dyslexia can find maths difficult um, because of these set sequencing problems and that kind of thing. Um, but also because word problems are very difficult for them to understand and then even get to the number stage of the problem. So, uh, anything else on, on that one, Ludo, that you'd like to ask? No, it's, it's just important to say, so, you know, you set out before that dyslexia is, is a difficulty of, of reading, writing and spelling, but it, it's not limited to that. And it's certainly, you know, there shouldn't be kind of uh, pigeonholing of, of dyslexia as, oh, you know, if you struggle with your left, you know, you're finding your left and right, then that's, um, you know, then that can't be dyslexia. I think it's really important to set out the wider parameters of, of how dyslexia can affect uh, a student's other kind of learning areas. And also there's an overlap between different uh, specific learning difficulties like ADHD, ASD, um, dyspraxia. You'll, you'll have um, overlap and it's called comorbidity, which is not a nice word, but um, you know, some of the, um, if you've got a short term memory, uh, you may um, also have ADHD, but you might not, but that's something that could come up in more than one uh, specific learning difficulty. You know, the inability to concentrate and focus and remember things can come up in different uh, difficulties, as it were. Yeah. Uh, motor skills and coordination may also be affected. So that can go into the area of dyspraxia as well. Developmental coordination delay, I think it's called, or difficulties. Um, dyslexia exists in all cultures and across the range of abilities and socioeconomic backgrounds. Now, this is an important one because um, when I started to study dyslexia, there was very much um, emphasis on uh, there being a difficult a difference, a discrepancy between um, reading, writing and spelling attainment and underlying ability, general ability, um, which would be uh, you know, like the old IQ test, really, um, but a bit more sophisticated, like not, um, verbal reasoning and non-verbal reasoning. Um, and if the underlying ability was much than the much higher standardized score than the literacy, um, that could be seen as an indicator. Um, and, uh, but the problem is with that is that dyslexia uh, occurs across the range of abilities. So you can have um, a, a below average uh, underlying ability and, and poor um, um, literacy as well, um, and still have dyslexia, even though there isn't a big discrepancy. Um, so let me find a quote for you. Okay, this is from Margaret Crombie, um, Dyslexia, a Practical Guide for Teachers. And I used this and another book to research this particular presentation. Um, so she looks at two different profiles. One is very uneven, um, some very high scores and some very low scores. And one of them, all of the scores are quite on the low side, they're all below average. So she makes a discrimination between general learning difficulties and specific learning difficulties. And she says, while it is acknowledged that dyslexia can affect all ability levels, it is still possible to observe discrepancies in children with lower ability levels, or those, although these will be smaller and less marked. So uh, that kind of backs that up. Um, and uh, um, you can generally see, uh, um, signs of dyslexia like reversals of letters and that kind of thing, um, and maybe some poor phonological awareness. Um, it is a hereditary lifelong neurodevelopmental condition. Unidentified dyslexia is likely to result in low self-esteem, high stress, atypical behaviour and low achievement. So it does seem to be uh, something that's based in the brain. It doesn't appear to be something that people grow out of. Um, so the sooner it's identified, um, the sooner the uh, interventions can be put in place and uh, the student is able to perform to their um, potential and display their understanding without the blockages. So um, there's a big uh, emphasis on early intervention um, and people have done lots of work on that. So that's good. 
Um, and I've told this story before, but my, my husband taught a student um, history, uh, A-level history, um, and the student had fantastic knowledge of, of history, fantastic memory, understanding, but had dyslexia in the sense that he can't, couldn't get anything down on, on paper at all. Um, so he was able to have his access arrangements. I think he probably had a scribe. Um, he might have had used a laptop, but I think he had a scribe, but he went on to Cambridge and did really well. Um, and obviously that's an exceptional example of a huge discrepancy between um, literacy scores and underlying ability. He would have been in, you know, like Mensa level in IQ, but um, because he had his access arrangement, because he, he had a dyslexia friendly environment, he was able to go on and, and achieve to a high level, which is really encouraging. Learners with dyslexia will benefit from early identification, appropriate intervention and targeted effective teaching, enabling them to become successful learners, confident individuals, effective contributors and responsible citizens. So that's all about the early interventions. Okay, how to recognize dyslexia, formal assessment. Formal assessment involves standardized tests of Underlying ability, verbal and nonverbal, literacy attainment, reading, writing, spelling, phonological processing, the awareness of sounds within words, speed of processing, e.g., rapid naming. There's a test that gives you lots of pictures, and they, there's about five different pictures, but they repeat in different order. And uh, someone with dyslexia, sometimes rapid naming is tricky. Um, and again, you count the number they do in a certain length of time, and that's the raw score, and then you can convert it into a standardized score. Um, visual processing speed, there's a good test of this, which is called symbol digit modalities test, and it's like a code of matching symbols to numbers and how many you can do in 90 seconds. Uh, short term and working memory I've already commented on, accompanied by observation of the student. Yes, yeah, so um, it's not just numbers because standardized scores have confidence intervals. Um, the the so-called true score um, is within a, a, a boundary of several um, like five marks either side or whatever it is for a particular test. So um, you can't put more emphasis on standardized schools than they, than they actually warrant. So it, you have to look at the child, um, get lots of background information, look at reports. Um, I used to sit in the classroom and observe the child and make notes. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's a big picture. Um, and you need, need to look at if, if the environment is actually friendly for students with dyslexia as well. Okay, so obviously as a tutor you, you won't necessarily um, know if your student has dyslexia, you're unlikely to see their um, formal assessment. Um, they might have a full diagnostic assessment from an educational psychologist or they might have um, more of a screening um, done by the school, um, but you won't necessarily know that. So there are some sort of signs that you can look at that um, may be more difficult to measure. You might notice that the student is very articulate, um, but then can get very little down on paper. Uh, that can be a possible indicator. Um, one of the tests I do for, um, it's called diagnostic reading analysis. It, um, it starts off with the listening comprehension and then plus reading comprehension. and Kind of compares the two and quite often a student with dyslexia will can listen to you reading a passage and, and get all the questions right but when they they're relying on reading themselves um, then the scores go down. Um, reading is effortful and not at the level expected for his hurry. Spelling difficulties, letter reversals, memory difficulties. Now um, memory difficulties. Um, I had some students that I thought um, or who were on the SEN list, um, who um, had poor memory difficulties, uh, had poor memory, but they, did, they, did, they weren't dyslexic. They had maybe just one low score in, score in their whole profile, and that was um, memory difficulties. So I used to um, put on their pupil profile that the teachers should do certain strategies for children in the class with working memory difficulties. That would be um, break down the verbal communication from the front and to manageable chunks with um, vocabulary that all children could understand. Ask for some feedback from the students that they are understanding what's being said because they can't hold on to a lot at the same time. 
um, accompany what you're doing by visual cues, have something um, on the board or hold up a picture to sort of reinforce the memory and you get into the multi-sensory approach then. Um, and then I was in secondary and uh, the students were allowed and the teachers knew that they could write notes as the student, as the teacher was explaining the task, the student could write notes and so they didn't have to ask for it all to be repeated. Um, so those, those would be my basic um, advice for students in the classroom with so, poor memory. So Hazel, um, it would just be interesting to maybe note at this point, um, do you think these indicators have become harder to spot in, you know, over the online sphere? Um, I'm not really sure. That's not something I've thought about particularly. Um, I think I've, I've just started online tutoring just in the last few weeks, and I must admit, I find it extremely difficult. Um, I, I feel like there's a barrier between me, me and the student, particularly um, you they don't want the cameras on a lot of them, which is fair enough. And, and in Bramble, we've, we're in the notebook and we're focusing on the notebook. But I, do f I don't think I'm able to assess the children in a way I would if we were like face to face and yeah, you know, and you can't bring in. Um, uh, it's very difficult to use manipulatives, which are very important in um, in maths, uh, particularly because um, I've been through this framework before the inactive iconic symbolic. It's now morphed into something called um, practical. Um, I don't know, pictorial and abstract. I think, um, but some students do need to be able to see what they're doing with maths to be able to understand it, particularly children with dyslexia. They can, I, I read in an article, they, they name before, they do before they name. So they, you know, I am finding that online teaching um, is quite difficult. I, I feel I haven't picked up a lot about my students, which I might pick up really quickly, you know, in a, in a, uh, a live situation. And certainly in the classroom, I can pick up things you know, I knew a lot anyway, but I could pick up things like almost every dyslexic boy. I don't really like saying dyslexic person. I like to say boy with dyslexia. I prefer that. It's not their whole identity. So um, they all dyslexic mantle their front ends. I don't know why. Maybe I think we have more boys with dyslexia than girls, actually. But, you know, they always dismantle their pens and they make contraptions. And they find things around the classroom and they couldn't sit still. And um, there was one uh, boy who made an amazing contraption pinged it and a, a, a spring from his pen ended up in the light and it was there for years and years and then we got new lights but if, it, if anybody started going into projectiles when I was teaching I'd say this is what happened <laughs> you know it's there for everybody to see not that it really mattered but um you know uh, so I'd give fidget toys I'd have a, a like a dog training toy um one of these rope things um, and I'd give it to a student to, to play with because I think some just need it. It helps their concentration if they're fidgeting with a toy. So that's another aspect. Um, and some just couldn't sit still. And uh, I was saying to Ludo yesterday that um, there was a teacher in the school and we had a child who he may have ended up, he may have had ADHD actually, but he couldn't sit still for any length of time. Um, so she would send him on errands, on like fake errands to another teacher. So thank you for receiving this letter from me. <laughs> We didn't have any information, but it, it gave a rest, it gave a movement break. And yeah. I think for many students in the classroom, and certainly it will be in the tutorial as well, you know, they may need movement breaks um, because sitting still and learning in a particular way is not their forte. Yeah. Real. Okay. Uneven learning profile, as I've said before. Um, but like I say, be aware that dyslexia occurs occurs at all ability levels. Okay, now strengths of students with dyslexia, I've seen this many times, many different, you know, strengths, um, but you have to be aware that there will be some students with dyslexia who maybe don't have these other outstanding gifts. So, you know, the, um, but they may have other um, strengths in the area of emotional intelligence and practical things. I think uh, Gardner's uh, multiple intelligences theory has got a lot to it, although I think that's gone out of favour, you know, all the different kinds of intelligence you can have, but not many of them measured in school. Um, but uh, anyway, enhanced uh, creativity. Not all dyslexic learners are creative, but those who are will often be very original thinkers who consistently come up with unique solutions to 
behavior problems. The differently wired brain seems to convey the gift of creativity in certain areas, something that is beginning to be recognized by employers. Neil McKay um, is, a, is one of my, is my other source for today. And I'm just gonna tell you what the book is called. Um, I, I'm on the second edition, but there is a new edition um, and it comes from the Dyslexia Friendly Schools Toolkit. Removing Dyslexia as a Barrier to Achievement, Neil McKay. And he's very well thought of um, in the area of um, uh, dyslexia. So, um, yes, so in the, I had a group of eight students who were in the literacy support group and um, they, between them, they had some superb gifts, actually. Um, I mean, one of, we used to give news every week and they loved doing that. And they were very, very verbally clever, most of them actually, um, even though they couldn't write much down. Um, but one of them said, I don't want to give news. I want to um, play a, 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 a tune, a, a, some music to you on the piano, which was in the classroom. And he played by ear, this most amazing piece of music. And um, there was one student in school, a girl, she, she um, had dyslexia, she understood it, and she came and helped the children, came back to school when she'd left and helped the children. She'd gone to university, had a degree, had all the things in place to help her with her dyslexia, but she picked up a guitar and just taught herself. But her, her brother, who was very academic, he just went through, ground his way through the lessons and said, I wish I could do that like you. So, you know, it's finding, and when I assess a child with dyslexia, and I, I'm not qualified to do a full diagnostic, but I can, you know, I'm qualified to use the tests and um, make some spots and traits. Um, um, yeah, I do, I do dyslexia screening assessment. Um, and I, I like to do a range of tests so that I can come up with some good news for the parent because there usually is something that stands out as being a, a particular gift, um, which, because, um, you know, with children with specific learning difficulties, you encourage them to use their weak, use their strengths target their weaknesses and often they've done that anyway be it they've got strategies to survive um, so uh, yeah so enhanced creativity um, there's also um, someone called Ron Davis and he advocates he's he's invented this dyslexia correction method which is quite controversial among the academic field um, but I think there's something in what he says that a dyslexic brain can often just look at an object and see it from all different angles. Imagine they're behind it, at the side, above. Um, and this does seem to be, he's, he's written a book called The Gift of Dyslexia, which um, is very interesting to look into. Um, okay. Yeah, and this is what I just mentioned. Aptitude for constructional and technical toys and activities, strong 3D and spatial awareness. Yeah, when I'm assessing primary age students, I often ask them, um, do they like playing with Lego and a top Meccano? And you can find quite a lot of information just by asking what they like to do. Um, okay, and this is uh, Margaret Crombie. I apologise, my husband has uh, misspelled the surname here. He was my helper. Often the student with dyslexia will have a holistic global style of learning, which does not always respond well to the sequential analytic way of teaching, which many teachers adopt. So they're often big picture thinkers. Okay, so this is something I came up with to try and hopefully it's memorable because it's four S's. To think how we could um, help as tutors when we teach students with dyslexia. So I've come up with four key points, strengthen, scaffold, substitute and support. Okay, so when I was thinking about tutors, Tutors um, are employed for different reasons. Um, and they base, and these are two important areas. Um, you might be a literacy support tutor um, with um, working with a student with dyslexia and, and they want to um, make some more progress with their reading and spelling and writing. So um, you would uh, look at their um, areas where they particularly struggle, where they've got low standardized scores and target those. So you might be paired reading, you might do spelling of high frequency words, that's very important in the early days, so at least they've got a bank of the most ones that come up a lot that they are confident with. Phonics training, uh, memory training, um, I've got lots of um, ideas of how that can be done. Um, or mm, a lot of us will be subject to tutors, particularly on the National Tutoring Programme. Um, so 
uh, one thing you can do is pre-teach the subject's specific vocabulary or at least make sure that they are confident in the subject's specific vocabulary because if they don't understand the language of the subject, they can't get onto the concepts. Um, okay, discuss, discuss the material. Um, McKay says, uh, many children need a good listening to. We say he needs a good talking to, don't we? But he says many children need a good listening to. So um, the, the teachers in, in the school who are good at dyslexia-friendly teaching, they would have a discussion phase of the um, lesson where you could talk about it um, because that can really help in the learning and the memory. Um, use a multi-sensory approach which is a huge subject. Um, we could do weeks on that um, but it is a, a very important uh, topic. Anything to say there Ludo? Uh, not at this point. I'm, I'm really enjoying the, the four S's. They're, they're such a helpful way to remember uh, kind of the, the key points in this. I I'm sure that will be used very much as, as people's takeaway here. So thank you. Um, so scaffolding um, is creating a structure to support learning. Um, so I, I was just thinking, what is learning? And I, I think it can be summed up. Uh, as knowledge, understanding, and skills. So um, when you scaffold the child in their learning, basically you're doing some of the heavy lifting for them um, so that they can achieve, um, but they don't have to have all of those mental processes going on um, at the same time, which would just lead to overload. Um, now, some examples here would be, um, I used to teach GCSE science, and um, a lot of the exercises were they called them close exercises, C-L-O-Z-E, anyway, um, where you just have a sentence uh, and you have to put the um, word in. So um, it will be something like um, the shortest wave um, uh, electromagnetic radiation is, and it will be either X-ray or gamma, but they, could, they didn't have to uh, write down the whole sentence. It was minimizing the literacy demand, so and maximizing um, the learning of the science, which of course is the most important thing. Um, writing frames, that's you know starting off the paragraph or or um, doing a structured writing where you you uh, you have um, you know word bank at the side where you can refer to so the children aren't worried about spelling um, and uh, Paired reading, if, you, if you're doing that scheme, which I think was originally devised by a man called Topping, um, you know, just uh, start by doing a lot of the reading. When we were in class, some were very reluctant to read, and this was in the literacy support group, so it, it, they were all in the same boat, but one just wouldn't read. And, you know, I'd just say, how about a sentence? Just do a sentence and, you know, and give them lots of praise, but then, you know, scaffold by doing a lot of the reading, then adjusting the balance in time. Um, mind maps, Tony Buzan, um, an excellent uh, way of scaffolding a, a task. Um, in, in maths, you would give a word example. Um, um, my husband said he does model, his history teacher, model essays and paragraphs. They're, they're ways of scaffolding rather than just letting the child loose with so, such an open task that they don't even know where to start. Um, and I was just thinking, um, let let me, I was trying to think how scaffolding applies to knowledge, understanding and skills. These are my own ideas, so <laughs> don't blame anyone else for them. But um, I had to think about this. Um, I was thinking about writing. So, um, okay. So for writing, um, you could, for your understanding, you can scaffold understanding um, by using the, the, uh, the Peter paragraph. You probably know about this, Ludo, um, but I've, I have helped in an English lesson. Um, and when they're looking at a particular um, piece of writing um, and they have to do an analysis on it, the teacher will tell them to do points, evidence, techniques, explain and read a response. So they practice doing these Peter paragraphs and they know that in the this is in GCSE and Key Stage 3, but they will get the marks for doing covering all those points. So the Peter paragraph idea is, um, is a way of scaffolding understanding. 
Um, so you might be um, just improving your writing skills, um, in which case uh, you can um, set, you can use a writing frame so that you don't have to do all the writing. Um, so that might be um, a way you can scaffold writing as a skill and um, a knowledge. You might be writing against about a topic like the Romans or something, um, and you could uh, give a word list um, for the student to refer to so they didn't have to do all the remembering of the words and the spelling. So that would be a way, three ways where you could scaffold um, understanding and also knowledge and also skills. So that's my okay. understanding of it. Thank, thanks for working that through. So, so the next step then is, is the substitute, isn't it? Substitute is um, giving ways different uh, students different ways of displaying their knowledge and understanding. Um, so some students just find writing really difficult. Um, so and I've I've sat in key stage three English lessons and with a teacher who's very very good at doing a variety of task types and, and ways of consolidating knowledge. Um, so you, it might be oral presentations. It might be um, video clips. Some students. Are, you know, I have got the um, equipment and they can, well, everybody can now, I think, uh, maybe do a, a bit of, like a mini documentary on something, acting, um, debating, model and poster making. Um, the um, uh, uh, year sevens where I, I work, they always used to, um, they went to a castle and they would do, um, all do fantastic um, models of this castle when they came back and they were brilliant. Um, if a student has dyslexia and, and finds writing difficult, within a class situation, you would give them photocopied notes to highlight so they didn't have to copy from the board because that is just so hard for many to do. Um, and typing instead of handwriting. Yeah, I, I often say when I do a report, um, learn to touch type as early as possible. And for some students, that's not possible. But if you can learn typing early on, I mean, so much of our life now is around word processing as opposed to handwriting. Um, I think typing is a really important skill. Yeah. It's sometimes, uh, sometimes hard to remember um, good handwriting yourself when you spend the whole day. Exactly. Emails and reports and, and documents, but um, yeah. That, one, thing, one thing is, is hard is, um, is writing um, uh, on a bramble. <laughs> really yeah. hard. Yeah, well. Find that hard. You can type, but if you could do fractions and things like that. You, you, you do need to be able to do some handwriting. Yeah, well, we're all learning new skills, aren't we? Brill, so, that, so that, that's a really, really helpful way of, of kind of um, manifesting the way that you work, but in different formats. And those are, those are some really top skills for tutors, really. You know, if you've got uh, a student who want, who's submitting a piece of work, you can suggest doing it in a video clip and you could maybe do yeah. a model yourself beforehand to show them how it's done or, um, you know, you could act out a debate. Those are brilliant, brilliant practical tools. And now onto the, the final step of this, this four step piece. Um, yeah, see my blog, access arrangement support. Um, here I'm talking about the, um, um, the accommodations that are put into place uh, for, uh, for, for public exams. So um, this is a huge thing, but I do have written a blog on it for those who want a bit of light bedtime reading. Um, so access, Access arrangements um, include 25% extra time, reader and or scribe, laptop with or without spell and grammar check. There's a list of about 15 to 20 of them, and they it's all governed by the Joint Council for Qualifications, JCQ, um, and it's all very highly regulated. Um, so it's not something you would be able to do unless you are, would be fully qualified as an access arrangement assessor, um, and it's always organised through the school. So, um, but you might be able to, um, uh, you know, flag something up if you are concerned and then the parent could take their concern into the school and feed it into the whole picture. Um, and that would be seen as background evidence. And then if the SENCO thinks um, that uh, the, the, the child um, needs assessing, um, they would either do it themselves if they've got the qualification or invite um, an external assessor who has an established relationship with the school. So um, if you know that a student has, does qualify for access arrangements then, um, and they have 25% extra time in, in, the, in their exams, then be sensitive to that in the tutoring that they are gonna need extra time because they might have um, slow processing speed or something else. 
And uh, I was saying to Ludo when we were talking yesterday that we, um, there was one student who was uh, assessed by an educational psychologist and she came out of having slow speed of processing and I was sitting in on the feedback um, uh, session because I was taking over from the Zenko who was, who, who was before me. Um, and she was so nice. She said to the parents about this child, um, the brain takes the scenic route, which I thought was a nice way of putting it. So you might have someone with, with slow speed of processing and uh, they, they'll get there. But they'll just take a little bit longer and they may well qualify for 25% extra time. Okay. Great. Okay. So um, the feel good factor, this comes from uh, McKay, Mackay. Um, 80% of learning difficulties could be due to stress. Removing the stress leaves 20 percent of the problem we can work with that um, and that's why I really like um, the uh, seven piece of professionalism that we we get we start with in the um, qualified tutor training and uh, positivity is just so important and, and as Judy said about maths anxiety the, the students get so anxious about maths that their brain just can't function properly um, so um, this is what he says about it um, I don't know if it's in his recent book, but I doubt if the recent one will be very much different. Um, minim this is Mackay. Minimising a fear of failure. Uh, use the language of success. Mistakes are cool because they mean that somebody tried. There is no failure, only feedback. Um, avoid death by deep marking. That means, um, you know, don't correct every spelling mistake. Um, and just uh, concentrate on, on what the student is able to do and the, the content. Um, so uh, that I thought was really encouraging. So this positivity is just so, so important, but it has to be, it has to have content as well. I mean, I, I, I'm, I like to encourage all the success of, of my students, but um, you know, those that are coming up to GCSE, I have to be realistic about, if I just say, oh, you're fine, you're fine, you can do everything, and you're gonna do really well and everything, and then they don't do very well because it's just confidence, not based on substance, then that's not good either, but it's got to be based on, them actually having the skills to do what they need to do. Um, and they need lots of encouragement to master those skills, knowledge and understanding. Okay, so this is another huge topic, multi-sensory is best. And this is a controversial area because um, there was a huge learning styles movement about 10 years ago where um, and all teachers were involved, many teachers and textbooks were based on it, like, you know, kinesthetic task and this kind of thing. and we would do a VARC questionnaire, which is visual, auditory, uh, read, write, and uh, kinesthetic, and um, sort of label the student as their dominant learning style. But um, there's been research into it, and I don't think it's necessarily the case that using a song's preferred style leads to better outcomes. So um, I've just got a quote here. Um, I've just done a course with Dyslexia Action on multisensory learning. Um, uh, this is uh, Professor Bruce in a Guardian newspaper article in 2017, the claim that students will perform better when teaching is matched to their preferred sensory modality learning style is simply not supported by the science and of questionable value. So um, that's worth bearing in mind, but certainly um, multi-sensory learning is, is definitely in vogue and very, very well um, evidenced. Um, and multi-sensory learning is um, using all your different senses. And it seems to be that if you use them all at the same time, that is even particularly effective. So I have a quote. This is from Margaret Crombie as well. If anybody wants one book to take, a, you know, to look into it in greater detail, this would be recommended because it's so up to date and so comprehensive. Um, okay. However, success can be achieved when there is coordinated interaction of all the requisite senses when the child sees, hears, writes, and speaks simultaneously. This multisensory learning then integrates the visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and oral capabilities of the learner and encourages the use of the child's strengths while at the same time exercising the weak areas. This helps enhance memory and promotes learning. And this is on the chapter on structured, cumulative, multi-sensory approaches and that seems to be a title that's popular because I've just done a course on it and that's called structured cumulative multi-sensory approaches so um, it's not just using senses in a random way it's doing it in a structured and effective way um, 
Yeah, that's really, really important and really important for, for tutors to try and in, integrate that, implement that in, the, in their kind of in their sessions, if that's something that they see as going to be an effective way of, of, of treating it. Um, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Hazel. Ah, we, we're at the end now. So um, dyslexia is never the fault of the child, but rather the responsibility of us who teach to find methods that work for that child. What a, what a lovely way to finish. Yeah, maybe that I feel that that should that should be a little quote in the top of each slide almost just as that's something that always to, to bear in mind. So I think, you know, we've moved on such a long way and, uh, you know, the the uh, the idea of having a dyslexia friendly environment um, is uh, um, beneficial to so many children who would, you know, not not have been able to succeed in the past. I think we've still got a way to go, but um, you know, it, it is much more uh, widely recognised. And uh, some people say that good teaching for dyslexia, students with dyslexia is a good teaching for all. Um, and, uh, um, you know, that there is something in that. Um, certainly uh, not everybody needs it, but, uh, you know, it, it, is, it is a very helpful way of, of, of teaching and learning. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, as Hazel, has mentioned a couple of times if you want to dive deeper into this um hazel's given us a an overview here of, of kind of some of the best bits and, and, and the structures to use but um the uh, books will be in the in the show notes below um but they are a, a practical guide for teachers by dr margaret uh, crombie and the dyslexia friendly schools toolkit by neil mckay so those are two of the kind of the most up-to-date. It's actually, um, yeah, Removing Dyslexia as a Barrier to Achievement is the title. It's just part of the toolkit series. Yeah. OK, great. Yeah, that is. I'll, I'll put that down there below. And the um, that's but, got a third uh, edition now. Hazel, so. thank you very, very much for that. It's a pleasure, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. I, hope, okay. I hope it's helpful anyway. If anyone gives yeah. me feed work, feed off, feed feedback, make it, make it constructive. <laughs> yeah. Well, this may be the first I don't consider many. myself an expert. I've just got a certain amount of knowledge through my uh, working career. No, absolutely. And it rounds off this month's theme uh, very nicely. Obviously, this this month was was um, send as a as a wider um, category, not just dyslexia, but um, you know, it would be tricky to to summarize each each condition underneath that umbrella term. So we, we chose one which we felt was 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 um, one of the more fairly common ones and ones that, that's largely you know often misunderstood. So uh, thank you very much, Hazel. Uh, You're and, welcome. Um, see you soon then. See you in the community afterwards. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.